Welcome to the place where we learn about and learn from the leaders in our field who are powering human creativity. I am Aaron Dworkin, and this is Arts Engines. <laughs> Thanks again for joining me here on Arts Engines. Today's guest is Edward J. Lewis III, who serves as president and CEO of Caramore. Ed, welcome to the show. Thank you, Aaron. It's really a joy and pleasure to be here and part of the show. Thanks so for I Oh, no, absolutely. And I am so excited uh, to be able to have you on the show. I've obviously been able to see your leadership and and just know about it and, and the impact that you have on our field and want to hear a lot more, uh, obviously, about uh, Terramore, which is also is one of our amazing and wonderful creative partners here for Arts Engines. Um, so I thought maybe it might be good just to start off to share with our audience, what's the scope of the work that is done at Terramore? Sure. Caremore, if you've never been, is quite a special place. And our mission is to enrich lives through innovative and diverse musical performances of the highest quality, uh, mentoring young professional musicians through our year-long Ernst Stiefel String Quartet in Residence program, and our two week-long programs, uh, the Evnen Rising Stars program for string players and the Schwab Vocal Rising Stars, both of which include a collaborative a a pianist, and educational programs for children centered around music through our Care More Kids programming and children's programming throughout our performance seasons. So our concerts are curated for each of our four distinctive outdoor spaces and indoor music room in the historic Rosen House, you know, per the artists and the works being performed. And this allows us to create intimate experiences for both the artist and audience. Uh, Caramore is also known for its beautiful gardens and grounds and epic picnicking. You got to do the picnicking. Um, we're home to an innovative permanent outdoor sound art collection, one of the very few in the world. Uh, the historic Rosen House is on the National Register of Historic Homes, and it's filled with an eclectic Renaissance and Asian art collection. It was built by our founders, Walter and Lucy Rosen, to showcase their love of music and the arts. And it's a fabulous place to tour and enjoy one of our high tea experiences. I can say that the Caremore experience is truly transformational in that the convergence of an exciting and diverse mix of remarkable live music experiences that are stunning gardens and grounds and historic home kind of leaves the artist and audience refreshed and renewed. Um, it compels all who come for the first time to want to come right back. Uh, it truly, truly is an amazing space. We're looking forward to our summer season, uh, which opens uh, with the incomparable Audra McDonald and Orchestra of St. Luke's. Uh, we have one of our three large scale community events featuring the work Farming and Oratorio by Ted Hearn, written for the Crossing Choir. Uh, we are featuring recent two time Grammy Award winner jazz vocalist Samara Joy. Uh, we're featuring members of the Harlem Chamber Players in one of our music and meditation concerts in our sunken garden. The Avalos Quartet, fabulous Avalos Quartet, there are 2022-23 Ernst Stiefel String Quartet in Residence, and they'll give a world premiere of Derek Sky's Deliverance, uh, commissioned by Caremore for the quartet. And I'm really excited about Aruj Aftab, uh, the first Pakistani woman to win a Grammy. Uh, she will be performing in concert with Vijay Iyer to promote her new album, Love in Exile. Wow. Got a lot, on. Got a lot going on. It's, it's extraordinary. <laughs> and am I right that this is all kind of taking place on this kind of like magical, like 80 acres, basically, of a state? Is that is that right? That is correct. In the summer, you know, we're only using about 40 of our 80 acres, so I'll, I'll get to that later. But we have these four incredible outdoor venues. Uh, it's just 
quite magical, especially when Mother Nature and the weather works. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. So now kind of just pivoting a little to kind of leadership, right? We have so many people who are in their own leadership capacity at their organizations and kind of interested in people's approaches, things like that. And so kind of just wondering, as you are looking at Caramore and how you lead it and interacting board staff and uh, kind of looking at any key priorities, just wondering if you could kind of share with us any of your kind of driving strategies um, and things that you're employing or thinking about? Great, thank you. Great question, Aaron. Um, you kind of my vision for Caremore is to really take this storied legacy institution and to make it more open and accessible for a broader and more diverse community and kind of changing the perception that Caremore uh, is seen now as a place for everyone. Um, and I'm kind of doing that by balancing the reverence and relevance of Caremore and its rich, but perhaps not diverse history until much more recent times. Um, you know, as I shared in my panel discussion at the Sphinx Connect Impact uh, 2023 conference, and I was so grateful to be included, I talked about employing relentless incrementalism and rapid radical transformative, uh, transformative change, both simultaneously and separately, kind of to make systemic change. So, for example, I've been relentless about ensuring that we have the staffing structure skill sets and resources, uh, or the people proposition, uh, as I call it, in place in order to su successfully carry out our value and revenue propositions. And then at certain points, leveraging progress made by the people proposition, I've been able to move certain critical projects that may have been on the back burner to the forefront to more quickly drive systemic change in the organization. Of course, like a lot of organizations, DEI is important to our work and it's embedded in our recently approved five-year strategic plan. Um, I joined Caremore in the spring of 2021 and they had just completed a DEI assessment and it was quite thorough and they'd already begun making some changes. But realizing that I, as a CEO, uh, could not and should not do this work alone, uh, we engaged a consultant to help put an infrastructure in place to begin to implement uh, some of the recommendations. Uh, we established both board and staff DEI committees, developing charters and vision statements for each to kind of guide their activity and signify their commitment to the work. Here again is where I focused on the people proposition, the board, staff, and key external stakeholders working together to carry out the mission of the organization. You know, at Caremore, um, we do believe that diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility at all levels of our organization creates a more powerful, creative, empathetic, and vibrant community of artists and audiences. And we are committed to implementing solutions to dismantle the inequities, exclusions, and erasures that have shaped many legacy cultural uh, centers. And we're kind of doing this through our work to expand the canon of classical music repertoire by including and amplifying the voices of composers and performers who, you know, through systemic forces have been historically marginalized uh, to including a broad range of lived experience of artists in the genres we present, such as jazz and roots and um, Broadway. And then co-curating culturally meaningful and relevant engagement programming with the communities that we seek to serve. We really want to make sure that our, our expanding and increasingly diverse audiences are welcomed. And you've heard this before, so that they can hear themselves in the music and see themselves uh, reflected from the stage. And we've also re-envisioned our legacy school program and, and entitled it Care More Kids which serves under-resourced schools in the county. And then thanks to the support of our generous board members, we provide that program for free. You know, I, I believe that as a BIPOC leader, especially in this space, uh, we bring a lens that can help an organization be like astutely aware of the unconscious biases and blind spots across many aspects of the enterprise. So kind of, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> so, that's all, just a little bit, right? Uh <laughs> just a little bit in two years, yeah. <laughs> It's it's amazing, and the impact you've been yeah. having in just a relatively short time so far is is really amazing. And I'm curious as you look across this, right? There's many in our audience who are and have been doing some of this DEI work at their own institutions. As as you've experienced that, has there been any of what you feel has been like the greatest challenge or the greatest area of you know what this is something we've still either got to you know figure out or or as you were going through things that you were most kind of either worried about or or felt like might have the biggest challenge? 
Well, what could be a challenge is also an opportunity. So for many years recently, Caremore has expanded its programming. Uh, and we've been doing that work even before I arrived. And I, I think for us is making sure that um, as we are expanding our audience and we've got this ever increasing, uh, increasingly more diverse audience, making sure that they feel welcome. I think that's one of the most important things, you know, Caramore has had this perception that it's not for everyone. You know, we are primarily a classical music uh, 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 cultural center. Uh, but, you know, for example, last year we brought the, the, the play with music, the Chevalier uh, uh, to Caramore. And audiences went crazy. Actually, uh, actually, um, Bill Barclay said it was, um, it was one of the most receptive places. But one of the things that that we did is that we made sure. I think we were one of the first uh, uh, presenters that had an all BIPOC orchestra as part of that performance. Mm -hmm. The audiences uh, they were so intrigued. They're eager to learn, especially cultures other than their own across the board. And they, uh, you know, during the Q and A, they're like. We want more. We want to know more about these types of composers, about Joseph Ballone. You know, are there others that we need to be aware of? So we've been putting that in our programming throughout the year. It's absolutely such extraordinary work. And I think because it may not have even uh, but shared for our audience, where is Caramore in case anyone's ah. coming to visit you? <laughs> yes, please do come visit. It's very easy to get to. We are about an hour north of New York City, you can take the Metro Rail North. We're in the town of Katona, New York. Awesome, absolutely awesome. So unfortunately, we are just about out of time, but I always yeah. like to ask of all my guests, this work that you share, obviously a breadth of programming and impact and 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 key aspects to the strategic plan, so on and so forth. There's gotta be some tough days or days where you feel like, oh man, are these obstacles you know, gonna be able to be overcome? And just wondering as a leader, Mm -hmm. Do you have uh, tools or mechanisms that you bring to bear for yourself as a leader during the tough times? Yes, I, I think taking the time to reflect on what is happening, but I also like to read. And I like to read about especially how the human spirit can overcome adversity, whether through art, public policy, or, or other means. Uh, like right now, I'm reading several books simultaneously. This is just so me, uh, including Singing Like Germans, Black Americans in the Land of Bach, Beethoven, and Brahms. Uh, I really am fascinated by Eddie Glau Jr.'s book, uh, James Baldwin's America, and Heather McGee's The Sum of Us, to really have a deep understanding of policy and what's happening in the world around us. I just find that so inspiring. And of course, uh, I just recently finished uh, The Monster I Am Today, Leontine Price in Poetry and Verse, and our dear friend Rosalind Story's latest novel, Sing Her Name. I mean, I really uh, am trying to go outside of my field to really look at what, what's happening. And I find you know, examples of resiliency and, and other aspects uh, of moving you know, our work forward. It is just so inspiring and especially being informed by that kind of breadth of literature and how that informs you as a leader. Um, it, it really is truly inspiring. Edward J. Lewis III, you truly are one of the arts engines who is powering human creativity in our world. Thank you so much for everything that you're doing and thank you for being on the show. And thank you so much for having me, Aaron. Take care. Thank you.